If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Uh, I want to I begin today by talking about the conclusion of one of the greatest sermons of all time. I would argue it is the most important and most significant sermon ever preached. And it was Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. He starts in Matthew chapter 5 and goes to Matthew chapter 7. And after Jesus just says some of the most provocative and most profound truths ever heard, he ends, he concludes his sermon with these words in verses 24 and 25. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Everybody say foundation. 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 Jesus concludes the most profound sermon with the most profound statement, and it's this. Don't let what I just said remain as something you heard. Let it become something you live. See, when Jesus speaks, he doesn't just say things for us to ooh and awe ah and write in our notebooks and put on Twitter. When Jesus speaks, he says things in order for us to live them out and to build our lives on them. And so I want to tell you today that what Jesus says is not just profound, it's foundational. It is necessary for you to build your life on the words of Jesus Christ. And if you're not building your life around his word, then you're building a life that's headed for collapse. So this morning, my, my message for you is called Check Your Foundation. Check your foundation. Let's pray real quick. Holy Spirit, as we go into your word, we ask you to come into our hearts, open our minds, open our eyes and ears. Let every heart be receptive today. God, we want to be changed every time we open your word. Every time we open your word, God, we want to be changed and we want to be ready to hear and to apply what you're saying. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, Craig, throw that picture up there for me. I'm sure most of you are probably familiar with this structure, right? It's the leaning tower of Pisa, not pizza. Pisa. It is in Italy, so it is a little confusing. They should, I, I think they should rebrand it, but it's Pisa, which is a small little town in, uh, in Italy. As a matter of fact, the size of this town, it's about one-third the size of Fayetteville. So it's a very small place out in the middle of nowhere. And yet, the world knows about this structure, right? What's funny about the Leaning Tower of Pisa is it was never meant to be the Leaning Tower of Pisa. It was supposed to be the Tower of Pisa, right? And so, but this structure was built. It was actually built as a bell tower for the local um, cathedral. And it was built, uh, started construction in 1372, and it took them 200 years to finish this tower. It sounds like the United States DOT was the one behind the project, right? Um, and so it took them, and the reason it took them 200 years was because, um, if, sorry, if you work for the DOT, I'm sorry, just work faster. Um, it took them 200 years because of wars, famine, disease, all of these things that happened in those times. So, uh, over the course of 200 years, as they were completing this structure, they began to notice it was leaning. And uh, after they completed the project, and it had this massive lean, it's 185 feet tall, engineers began to study this over the course of, of centuries. And what they determined is that after 500 years, this tower had moved 17 feet. In other words, it was in a slow state of collapse. And I knew that if, it, if something wasn't done, eventually this was going to be unsafe, it was going to be dangerous, and it was going to fall to the ground. So they decided in the 1980s to go in and to uh, restructure it and to make it sturdy and stronger. The funny thing is, though, they didn't fix the lean because nobody wants the regular Tower of Pisa now. We all want the leaning Tower of Pisa. Right? Because it drew so much attention, and everybody, the, the tourism that comes there is, uh, is just uh, amazing. So, so the question is, why the lean? Poor workmanship, bad materials, poor planning. It was none of those. Right? The, the problem was not in the structure itself. It was in the ground beneath the structure. 
They determined that the problem was that the sandy soil this tower was built on was too weak to sustain the structure that big. And so the problem was in its foundation. I look at somebody and say, check your foundation. Check your foundation. The problem with this tower is that it was built on the wrong foundation. Now, what's humorous to me is because of that, the world has flocked to see it. Right? Everybody knows about this tower because it's doing something it's not supposed to do. A building's sole purpose is to stand, and this one is slowly falling. And because of that, people come from all over to take pictures and to look at this tower, right? What does that tell you about humanity? Well, this is what it tells you. We love to watch dysfunction. We love to watch a good train wreck. Do you want me to prove it to you? How many times did you watch Will Smith slap Chris Rock? Because I watched it a ton. I watched videos of people talking about it. I read articles of people commenting on it, right? And it wasn't just the slap. It was the dysfunction around the slap that made us all tune in. People haven't watched those award shows for years. Everybody knows what happened that night. It's because of the dysfunction. Let me prove it to you another way. How many of you have found yourself getting sucked into the black hole that is the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard circus court case? Right? We don't know these people. I mean, we feel like we know them way too much now. But, like, I've never heard of Amber Heard. I know Johnny Depp is Jack Sparrow. I, and now I find myself every day reading another article like, oh, oh, you know? And it's because we love dysfunction. We love to watch people's lives crumble. As sad as it is, we can't look away. And this is a perfect depiction of what your life looks like when you don't Obey Jesus' command in Matthew 7. Jesus makes all of these commands and these claims of, and these truths throughout Matthew 5, Matthew 6. And he gets to Matthew 7, and he says, if you don't build your life on this, your life is in a slow state of collapse. And this is what it looks like. Now, I'm thinking about the, the architect behind this tower. Because every architect dreams of building something that, that inspires people and that people are um, uh, just come from all over the world to take pictures of and to paint. And, and I, you think of the Taj Mahal or the Empire State Building or the Burj Khalifa, like these amazing structures that people uh, just, just uh, fantasize over and, and gawk at. And I'm thinking this architect, when he set out to build this tower, I'm sure he wanted to build something that would be remembered forever and that people would admire, right? I'm sure he wanted to build something that people would come and paint pictures of and take pictures of. Do you know the kind of pictures people take of the Leaning Tower of Pisa? Craig, show, show these pictures. These are the kind of pictures that people take. As a matter of fact, if you go out to the lawn in front of the tower, this is what you're going to see. Uh, the next one. All of these people, right? It's a joke. It's become the, the, the oldest meme, right? It's just a joke to everyone that this tower is doing something it's not supposed to do. Here's what I want to tell you this morning. You're not just living a life. You're building a life. And where you build and how you build and what you build matters. My question for you is, is the life you're building inspiring others or is it entertaining others? Is the life that you've chosen to build inspiring the people around you? Is it building the kingdom of God or is it just entertaining the people around you? See, this morning, the, the, the life that God has given you, he's given you to make something of. So what is your life pointing to? Here's the, here's the reality. God is the creator of all life, but he's not necessarily the builder of all life. You get to choose who builds your life, you or him. You get to choose what you build your life on, right? And so I, I, this morning what I want us to do is to evaluate what kind of life am I building? What is my life pointing to, right? Uh, is, is, is my life founded in something that is unwavering? Is it sturdy enough to raise my kids on? Is it strong enough to lead others in? Is it authentic enough for others to emulate and follow? Or is my life in a slow state of constant collapse. See, don't be deceived this morning. Just because 
your life isn't collapsing quickly doesn't mean it's not collapsing. The reality is the success and the health of everything in your life, your career, your marriage, your children, your finances, your goals, your dreams, the health of all of those things depends on what those things are founded on. Because your foundation determines your future. So if your foundation is off, your whole life will be built in vain. Now, I'm not much of a builder. I think I've established that. I think everybody knows that. Everything in my house that I've put together either has a very visible flaw or it's absolutely perfect because it fell apart and we had somebody else come and do it, right? Everything. But, so as little as I know about building, I do at least know this. And when you build something, the foundation is the most important thing. It's the most important thing, right? Now, he, here's the thing. I've I got a set of boxes up here, right? Um, and if, if you like to play with Legos or, or blocks, you know, i got two small kids who um, love to play with them. Davis loves to throw them and eat them. And Parker sometimes will build things. Um, but usually it's just me building things. And then they tear them apart. Um, but if, when you're a kid, you learn pretty quickly that the biggest things go on the bottom, the smaller things go on the top. I mean, the ancient Aztecs, Mayans, Egyptians all figured this out pretty early on. It's why the pyramids are built with a large bottom, small top. So if I were to give you these boxes today, Aaron, go ahead and come on up here, buddy. He's going to help me build today. If, uh, if I were to, to give you these boxes today, I think just about everybody in the room would know immediately the biggest box goes on the bottom. It's common sense, right? But here's, here's the problem. When it comes to building your life, we're not given boxes and we're not given blocks. We're given values. And, and I would argue that we spend the first two and a half decades of our life trying to figure out what values are most important to build our lives on. And so different people come up with different ideas. For some people, for some people, it's success. I had a couple of students make these boxes for me. Shout out to them. Um, for some people, it's success. Some people learn early on that if I get really good grades... Or if I get a lot of points on the scoreboard, or if I get the best position at my job, it gets me notoriety, it gets me power, it gives me influence. And so some people determine that the most important thing in life is success. And what they'll do is they will revolve everything in their life around obtaining success. Whatever a success looks like in your eyes, right? And so people will shift everything in their life to make sure they will be successful. The problem is, build that for me, Aaron, let's see how that works. Right? Problem is, when you try to build your life on success, right, you're living a life that's going to collapse, right? Now, for other people, maybe it's not success, but it's, whew, it's wealth, right? Because we live in a, we live in a money society, everything revolves around money. And we got a lot of money gurus these days. Like, there's no, there's no excuse now for not knowing how to manage money because every guy on YouTube is telling you how to manage your money, right? And we got, uh, you know, I'm a Dave Ramsey fan. I love it. I'm all for it. But this, we're breeding this mentality that says you got to rise and grind multiple streams of income, make your money, make money for you, right? You, like, you got to do, and it, look, I'm for it. But people will assume that wealth is the most important thing in their life. And they will shift every other priority in their life to favor how do I make money. The more money I get, for many people, the more worthy I am. Many people will attach their worth to their paycheck. And what happens when you make wealth your foundation, let's do it again, Aaron, right, is wealth is not a proper foundation to build your life on, right? Now, you're probably getting this, right? You're thinking, well, there's, there's more important things. Well, for some people, it's family, right? And family is important. I think we can all agree. For some people, like, listen, here's the reality. If you don't got family, you don't have anything. And People will revolve their entire lives around their family, around pleasing their family, around serving their family, being near their family. I'm all for it, right? 
But people will convince themselves that family is the most important thing in life. And everything else in life takes second priority to family. I can respect that. I think we all can respect, like, yeah, that's, that sounds really good. But what happens is when you make family the foundation of your life, let's just let that sit right on there, Aaron. It stands. But let's go back to Matthew 7. What did he say? He said, everyone who builds their life on the words that I have said would be like the man who built his house on a rock. He also says those who do not will be like their man who built his house on the sand. They both stood. Both of them stood. Both of them were enjoyed by the resident. Both of them were a structure that stood. And this structure stands. But what does he say happened next? Then the wind came and blew, and the rain came and poured. And now what you founded your life on is not just enough to stand, it's can it withstand a storm. So a lot of people are building a life that they think is good enough because it stands. But there's a difference between standing and being sturdy. So I know y'all, y'all are like, oh, we got it. We, he's a pastor, so we know what he wants. Church, right? It's ch- you, want us to, you want us to come to church. <laughs> we get it. We should base our life around church, right? And so there are some people who church is the most important thing. We will go to church every Sunday. We will pay our tithes. We're going to join a connect group. We're going to serve on a team. We're going to get baptized. We're going to be in attendance, and we're going we're to do what you're supposed to do when you go to church. And look, I'm all for it. I'd, I'd say I believe that church is very important. And there are people who think that church is the answer to their problem. I'm going to tell you something. Church is not the answer to your problem. Church may get you to the answer to your problem, but church in and of itself is not able to hold your life up. So you have, what you have is the same exact thing, right? Where you, you have this, this, this standing structure, but a standing structure is not a sturdy structure. So this is what I want to tell you this morning. The reason that I know these things cannot hold your life up is because I know some of y'all are looking at these things, you're like, but those are important. They are. Listen, they are all important. They're valuable, but they're not foundational. These are things that, listen, they, they, can, they can have a place in your life, but they cannot hold your life up. Do you hear me? And here's how I know this, because there's some of you in this room who you've been hurt by church. And there's some of you in this room who you've been deserted by family. There's some of you in this room who, who you know what it's like to be financially crippled. And to lose everything. And there are some of you in this room who knows what it's like to fail miserably at life. But guess what? You're still standing. And it's because at some point in your life, you realize these things cannot hold me up. There is only one thing that can hold me up. There is only one thing in life that I can trust. And his name is Jesus Christ. He is the cornerstone. uh, The chief cornerstone that the builders rejected. He is the one by whom and for whom all things are created. He's the rock of salvation. He is the place where we set our feet on solid ground. So all the other stuff holds value, but all the other stuff can't hold you. Thank you, Aaron. Appreciate you, buddy. All this stuff holds value, but it can't hold you. All this stuff is valuable, but it's not foundational. And what I'm here to tell you that, that in order for, for your family and for your church and for, your, and, and for a successful life and, and, and in order to manage your, your income, all of those things are going to depend on whether you have put Jesus at the foundation of your life. Now, I want to be clear. I believe there's a lot of believers, believers, who are building this, this monstrous structure in which they're trying to fit Jesus in. I mean, can you imagine, <laughs> like you saw putting this big old box on the top of small boxes, can you imagine trying to fit something so big in, in a structure that is so weak? And, and this is what's happening is people are trying to build a life and then put Jesus in their life. I'm going to say something very blunt to you. Jesus does not want to be a part of your life. 
Jesus either is your life or he isn't, but he can't be a part of it. You can't build with Jesus. You must build on Jesus. Jesus, Jesus said it like this, because y'all are like, well, that was a little. Let me just quote Jesus then. You cannot be my disciple unless you first hate mother, father, brother, sister, and even yourself. Jesus said that. What was he saying? He is foundational. Nothing else is. Nothing else is foundational. Holds value. It's not foundational. And, and I, I want to tell you this morning that in, in, if we keep treating Jesus like he's a piece to the puzzle of our life, we'll never be able to fit him in our lives. He's not a piece to the puzzle. He's the table the puzzle sits on. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? So, so we have to evaluate this morning, what am I building on? What kind of life am I building? Now, here's, here's what I want to do. I, um, I, I preached this series at, at BSM several months ago, and, um, and I believe that, that there's several foundations in Jesus that we must build our lives on. And this is why this is so important, because you will never build higher than your foundation is stronger. You hear me? A lot of people, influencers, the world is trying to teach people how to have this amazing life. There's a lot of people who are trying to push you into building this life that is visible and successful. But I'm telling you, everybody wants, everybody wants a life that is built very high. But nobody's talking about a life that is built strong first. Right? As a matter of fact, the, the foundation, most of you, the foundation of your home can't even be seen by the visible eye. Right? Nobody wants to focus on, on what's most important in life because it's not the thing that's going to appeal to everybody. Jesus is not appealing to the world. Jesus says, if they hate you, it's because they hated me first. Right? And so I, I want to tell you this morning that before you can build higher, you got to build stronger. That there has to be depth to your relationship with Jesus in order for there to be health in all of these other facets in your life. And so what I want to do um, is I believe there's, there's three different foundations that I, I want to focus on. But today, I'm just going to go over the first one. And then later in the summer or in the fall when I preach again, I'm going to circle back um, to the other ones. I'll bring the boxes back out. It'll be a grand time, okay? So I, I want to focus on the first one because I, I started looking at this this week and I was praying. And I felt like the Lord said, just stop right here. Um, and so today, what I want to talk to you, I'll give you all three right now, okay? Three foundations for your life. Jesus' blood, Jesus' body, Jesus' book. The blood, the body, the book. Today, I want to talk to you about the blood. Everybody say blood. 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 Now, all right, anybody get like queasy or faint whenever you see blood? All right, let me know. My next illustration is I'm going to make somebody bleed. So I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Aaron, come back. <laughs> no, um, I'm not going to do that. Um, the blood, blood in general, holds a lot of significance in our faith. So there's this, there's this principle when you study the Bible. It's called the principle of first mention. Okay? And uh, what it helps us do is to understand certain words in the Bible. Um, you got to remember the Bible is written in Hebrew and in Greek, and some in Aramaic. So a lot of times the words that we're reading in our Bibles could be translated several different ways. And so sometimes in order for us to really get the understanding of a word is we go and look at where that word is first mentioned. Now, question for you this morning, pop quiz, okay? Where do you think in the Bible the word blood was first mentioned? Genesis, you're right. In what story? Cain and Abel, there you go, Bible scholars in the room, okay? Cain and Abel, it's actually in Genesis 4, verse 10, and this is when Cain has murdered his brother, and the Lord comes to Cain in verse 10, and he says this, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. First ever mention of the word blood, Genesis 4, verse 10. Now, what do we learn from that? Right? Well, one thing we learn from that is that blood is often synonymous with life. So whenever it talks about the blood of a person or the blood of an animal, it's talking about the life 
of an animal. This is affirmed when you get to Leviticus in the law, right? Verse, uh, chapter 17, verse 11, it says, For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. So now we have this idea of atonement because what's happening is God is setting a foundation in the earth that says where there is sin, blood must be spilt. Now why is that? Because sin brings about death. And in order for you to have life in spite of your sin, something must die. It, this is what we call atonement, right? Atonement uh, is the Hebrew word kapar. Uh, it, it means to cover or to clothe. In other words, it's this idea that when, when we sin, we need, we're in need of something to cover our sin. Why do we need it to cover our sin? So that we can be at one with God, right? Atonement, at one meant, right? This is, this is what we are searching for in life. Every human being that walks the face of the planet is in need of this. We need to be at one with God. Whether we know it or not, it's what our heart yearns for. And so the idea of atonement comes to us from Leviticus 17, telling us that the life of a creature is in the blood of a creature, and the blood of a creature is what is necessary to atone for the sins of humanity. Now, I started asking myself, okay, where is atonement first mentioned, all right? And this is a little trickier. This is why there are universities and all these things that, that teach us how to read the Bible. Because where atonement is first, the word kapar, the Hebrew word, where it's first mentioned, it's not translated as atonement. It's translated as clothe. Because in Genesis 3 is where it's first mentioned. It says, that Adam and Eve, they ate the fruit. God comes and he disciplines them. He punishes them. And then because they recognize their nakedness, it says he then clothed them with the skin of an animal. He atoned for them. What's going on is God, long before God ever told the Israelites to slaughter a lamb or slaughter an ox, God himself kills an animal, takes his skin, covers their nakedness to atone for their sin. And it's setting in motion this principle where there is sin, blood must be spilt. Blood must be spilt. Now, you begin to see this as the reoccurring theme all throughout the Bible. You see altars. You see feasts and the temple. And all of these sacrifices are to be made because of the sins of humanity that we are unable to pay for ourselves. And probably the most significant depiction of this principle is uh, in Exodus and the ten plagues of Egypt, right? Ten plagues, God is demonstrating his power to Egypt. The Israelites are in slavery. He's going to set them free. And the way he does it is he sends these ten plagues over Egypt. All right? Uh, if you've never read it, you've probably watched Prince of Egypt. So you get it, right? And so he gets to the tenth plague. And the tenth plague, he tells Moses, this is going to, uh, this is going to involve everyone. It's going to touch everyone. He says, and this plague is simply this. At night, I'm going to send the angel of death, and he's going to go from household to household all over Egypt, and he's going to take the life of every firstborn. Man, woman, child, adult, animals, every single firstborn, their life will be taken as payment for the sins of the Egyptians and the Israelites. It's a very grave and serious thing. But he tells Moses this. He says, but if you will take a lamb, and slaughter that lamb and take its blood and cover the doorpost of your home, then when the angel of death comes to your home and sees the blood, he will pass over your home. This is what we call Passover. This is what Jews to this day still celebrate the Passover. It happens at Easter, right? And we celebrate the Passover too because it was the blood of Jesus, the blood of the Lamb who was spilt for us so that sin and death cannot have us because Jesus' blood has allowed for death to pass over, right? Okay. So this is a very significant thing in, in the faith. If you're not familiar with this, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to educate you today because this matters. The blood of Jesus, the blood of the Lamb matters, right? So now you, they set this precedent in the Jewish faith that now the blood of the Lamb is, is needed in order to cover and atone for our sins. 
And, uh, but you have to remember this. Where was blood first mentioned? It's mentioned in the story of Cain and Abel. Now, I want to take you back to that story for a second because I think this is very significant. Before Cain murders his brother, God gives him a chance to walk away. God, tries to, God intervenes and, and warns him against what he's about to do. And this is what it actually says in verses uh, 6 and 7 of, of Genesis 4. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. And it desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Okay, sin is crouching at your what? Door. What did Moses and the Israelites have to cover with blood? Okay, so Cain had a door, and Moses had a door. Now, doors represent opportunities. Where there's a door, there's a choice, right? Door number one, door number two, right? You understand. And I, and I told you today, you have a choice to make. Who's building your life? You or him, right? What are you going to build your life on? There's a choice to be made. Here, here Cain has a door, and Moses has a door, and both of them have instructions from the Lord. But look at the difference between their choices, right? Cain chose to step out and go looking for blood. Moses chose to stay in and be covered by the blood. Right? Cain wanted to be avenged. Moses wanted to be atoned. Cain abandoned the door. Moses appreciated the door. And, and so when Cain went out and spilled his brother's blood on the ground, what does the Bible say that the blood began to do? It began to cry out. It began to cry out to God. And so I asked myself this. Worship team, y'all can go ahead and come. We're going to wrap up. I asked myself this question. I, I'm aware that this is probably not literal. I'm, I'm sure the blood wasn't screaming with a liter, literal voice. But I, but I do ask myself, what was it that the blood was crying out? What was the blood of Abel saying? Now, here's what I believe with all my heart to be true. I believe the blood of Abel was crying out to God against Cain. This is what Revelation says the enemy does. It says he stands before our God, and he is the accuser of our brethren. The accuser of our brothers and sisters who stands before God accusing them day and night. Hurling accusations. And so I, I believe that God heard Abel's blood. I believe Cain heard Abel's blood too. And I believe what, what that blood was crying out was guilty. Shame. Condemned. Murderer. Worthless. Now, some of y'all know that voice really well. Some of you know what it's like to be haunted by your past. Some of you know what it's like to walk around with heaviness because of the choices you've made, the thing you said, the way you hurt that person, the thing you looked at, the thing you allowed in your home, the thing you allowed in your marriage. Some of you know what the voice of condemnation sounds like. As a matter of fact, I, I was interested, like, what does Abel mean? What is the word, what does the name Abel even mean? Found out that Abel actually means vapor or breath or in other words, momentary. So here's what Cain's dealing with. He's dealing with feeling guilty about something he did in a moment. And some of you know that voice, that what you said in the heat of that moment, what you did when you got caught up in your emotions, what you did when you were all alone and you thought nobody would ever find out. You know what it's like to hear the voice of, of the blood of Abel, the blood of a moment haunt you and condemn you and hurl insults at you guilty shameful murderer wicked and it's a voice of condemnation but i want to tell you this morning because i believe the lord wants to deal with that voice in your life this morning this is what hebrews 12 says i love this and i only need to read it i don't even have to preach it it says but you have come to mount zion to the city of the living God, 
the heavenly Jerusalem. You, you have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Hear this, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Did you hear me? The blood of Jesus speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. So I believe that while Abel's blood was crying out against Cain, and while Abel's blood cries out against you, and while the accuser cries out against you, Jesus' blood cries out for you. And his blood speaks a better word. So while, while the voice of condemnation tells you guilty and shameful and condemned and wicked and lost, the blood of Jesus cries out innocent, pure, holy, righteous, worthy, son, daughter, whole, healed. Are you hearing me? Forgiven, grace, mercy, my child made whole in the one that is Jesus Christ, redeemed, restored, revived, once dead but now alive, once lost but now found, once guilty but now innocent, able to stand before a righteous God. Come on this morning. I want to tell you today, Jesus has come to deal with the voice of condemnation in your life. And all over this room, as we begin to go into worship, I want to invite you, if this is a voice that has been in your life, today the Lord says no more. Today the Lord is putting to silence the voice of condemnation, and He's inviting sons and daughters to come hear the better word that His Son, the blood of His Son is speaking. So all over the room this morning, Holy Spirit, we release you to call sons and daughters home. God, I pray for those who have dealt with the heaviness and the weight of their past. And today, we declare that voice of condemnation is silenced in Jesus' name. Today, we declare the blood of Jesus speaks a better word. It speaks a better word. Hear me this morning. As we worship, I want you to feel free to come. If you want to pray at the altar, we have a ministry team who's who's ready to minister to you if you want, okay? As we worship, I want you to allow the blood of Jesus to speak a better word to you. There are some of you in this room who need to know what Jesus' blood is saying about you. And I'm here to tell you this morning, Jesus' blood is speaking a word specifically to you. Oh, hear him. Oh, hear him. Oh, ears be open this morning to hear the blood of Jesus Christ speak a better word forgiven, found, free, redeemed, restored. I invite you to come as we worship, okay?